Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I'm here today with another hand for PokerNews.com from the $10,000 buy-in tournament I played in Florida recently. And in this hand, we get pocket sevens. But we're not really concerned about the way I play my hand. We're going to discuss how the splashy player who we played with last episode plays his hand. Very, very important because it is a severe mistake that some players make on a regular basis. So he limped in with King Jack offsuit, and then this loose aggressive player made it 700. I think this 700 raise is quite awful because whatever the splashy guy is limping with, he's going to call for 400 more, and he's not really making an error because the pot's going to be, you know, whatever it's going to be. It's going to be 2,000 or so, right? 400 into a 2,000 pot, you're not making your opponent make an error. Ignore this 100,000 pot size. I don't know why it says that right now. Um, cutoff folds, button folds. And now it's on me with pocket sevens. I'm definitely going to call here. I want to see as many flops as I possibly can with hands that are going to be very easy to play after the flop against all of my opponents. And that's especially true from out of position. So we're going to call. We're not going to re-raise. I think re-raising would be quite terrible in this scenario because if I re-raise, what's going to happen? Well, the splashy guy is going to fold, and that's the guy I really wanted in the pot because he's going to be the player who makes the most blunders, most likely. And... The lag player who raised a 700 could just be making a 700 with aces because he uh, he made it maybe he made it small because he really wanted to keep the splashy player in and maybe he wanted to keep other players in, or you know maybe he's sitting here with a six offsuit and he's just going to fold, or maybe he'll decide to bluff me. Who knows? Anyway, I want to call. That's going to very close to close the action because now the only player who is likely to re-raise is the big blind and the big blind has a completely random hand, so. It's almost as if I am calling and closing the action the majority of the time, which is quite nice whenever you have a pair because you know you're not going to get blown off of it too often. And even then, unless um, one of these two players makes it 3,500 or more or something like that, I'm going to call and see a flop anyway. So we're going to call and try to get a 7. Now, to my surprise, <laughs> tight aggressive guy on the button, I'm sorry, the big blind makes it 2,650. Again, I think this is an awful raise size. The way you figure out how much a pot size re-raise would be, which is roughly one, what you want to be making when it is deep stacked, is to look, uh, take three times the last bet, which was 700, so that'd be 2,100, plus any additional money in the pot. So we have another 700, that's 28, plus 300 for a call, that is uh, 31. So at least 3,100 in this scenario. And then when you're out of position, you want to make it a little bit more to disincentivize callers. So I think here, whatever this player has, he should make it roughly 3,500 or so. And notice in this scenario, if I'm sitting here with 9-8 suited or pocket sevens, I'm not making an error calling for 1950 more because I'm going to play very, very well on the flop. And I have great implied odds. I'm not saying I'm going to play well because I'm a good player. I'm going to play well because I can look at the board and see if there's a seven or not, right? So anyway, splashy player is an easy fold. This is, again, a very big blunder. Splashy player should certainly fold now. He has 300 invested in a spot where loose aggressive player could easily have a good hand. I must have something decent. Tight aggressive player must have something decent. And King Jack is going to be dominated every which way. For all you know, you're against Ace King and um, you know Pocket Queens or something like that, in which case you're just completely screwed. It's not going to happen too often, but you never really know which way you're dominated. Like, say it comes Jack 7-3 and all the money goes in, you could still be beat. Or say it comes King 7-3 and all the money goes in, you could still be beat. Um, by a lot of hands in your opponent's range, not just a few. I understand you could always be beat by whatever the nuts are. But hands like King Jack, Ace-10, etc. are all very susceptible to being extremely dominated. And you really don't want to be dominated. Especially in a multi-way pot. So, just fold the King Jack. Just fold it. Get out of there. Loose aggressive player is probably going to call whatever he has and I'm going to call as well. And then I'm going to check every flop, even if I get a 7. Oh, hello, 7. Comes King, Queen, 7. All right. Now, I check, and the tight aggressive guy checks. I have no clue what the tight aggressive guy is doing. This makes no logical sense to me. Unless he has, like, exactly pocket jacks or pocket 10s. But even then, he made it way too small preflop if he had jacks or 10s. If he has ace-king, I guess you could check to see what develops. If he had ace-queen suited, he should have made it more preflop. Same with ace-king. I mean, he really should have made it more preflop with everything. So I guess that line of thought um, is sort of irrele irrelevant because it applies to his whole range. Um, I don't know what's going on here. He probably just re-raised way too wide, in my opinion. Or maybe he just decided to run a bluff. 
But when you're bluffing, you definitely don't want to give your opponents all great odds to call because they will. All right, again, the pot is incorrect here. It's not 100,000. The pot is 2,600 times four. So call it uh, 10,500. Checks around to the splashy player who now bets 10,000. So he pots it. I think this is a giant blunder. Why, you may ask? Well, especially with his exact hand, that jack of clubs is really important because he doesn't really have to worry about being against a draw, right? Because the most obvious draws are ace jack of clubs, ace ten of clubs, jack ten of clubs, jack nine of clubs, and ten nine of clubs, right? And he blocks half of those with that jack of clubs there. So now, his main concern is how do I get called by worse hands? So what are hands worse than king jack that are going to be in this pot? Well, ace queen and queen jack, right? So how do you get called by ace queen and queen jack? You definitely don't pot it. You bet 3,000. This is a situation where normally you do want to bet on the bigger side because the board is somewhat draw heavy, but the fact that he does have this jack in his hand really does skew that significantly because now he doesn't have to worry about being against nearly as many draws. Also, you can never really protect your hand from draws anyway. If someone has ace, 10 of clubs, they're not folding for any bet and they're not making a mistake, right? So definitely a spot to either bet small or just check. I think checking may actually be ideal because if you bet here and get called or raised by anyone, especially when you bet big, um, you're just going to be in bad shape with this King Jack. So if you bet 3,000, maybe you can get called by some worse stuff. And the problem with that, though, is that often you're going to be out of position against a loose aggressive player and then you have to check call out of position and that's not really where you want to be. If the tight aggressive guy check calls you, you certainly can check behind on the turn and then maybe call a river bet, although that's close too. It's a really crappy spot is what it amounts to. This really does illustrate why you want to just fold this king jack offsuit preflop after you limp and get raised and then re-raised. Anyway, he pots it. Lag calls. Wow. I did not expect lag to call here. Um, I mean, I guess calling is reasonable, but as you can see, their stacks are starting to get somewhat shallow. They only have 27,000 behind and the pot's already... Well, 10 going to the flop, and then another 10, and then another 10, so the pot's going to be 30. So they're going to have a pot size bet left on the river. Flag should have a pretty good hand. Um, okay, so now back on me. What do I do? Well, I definitely don't want to call here because even though the splashy guy knows that the jack of clubs is dead, I don't know the jack of clubs is dead. And at this point, I don't mind jamming because king-queen is definitely going to call, and there are the full nine combinations of king-queen in probably everyone's range. And then... Um, Ace-King may call, and also there are some draws, like I said. I mean, at this point, the lag guy here could have Jack-10, maybe even offsuit. Probably not, but maybe, and I definitely don't mind pricing that out, and Jamming will price that out. If he has, you know, Jack-10 of clubs, he's not going to fold clearly, but that's fine. Although, you know, in $10,000 buy-in tournaments, some people really do value their tournament lives, or I guess any tournament, because money is a relative thing. $10,000 is a lot to some people, and chump change to other people. It's important to understand that and realize that. So uh, you're typically, typically going to find, though, that some people will play a little bit tighter as the buy-ins get higher when they're risking their whole stack, especially if you can't re-enter, but I imagine this was probably a re-entry tournament. So anyway, I decide to jam, and in this spot, I'm not jamming a whole lot of hands. I'm just going to jam with king-queen, pocket sevens, um, pocket queens if I have it. Probably don't have it, though. Same thing with kings. And then if I have one of those draws, ace, 10 of clubs, ace, jack of clubs, jack, 10 of clubs, jack, nine of clubs, or 10, nine of clubs, I think I'm going to be in with all of those. If I had eight, seven of clubs, I may just call with that. Jamming could be fine with that too. Or nine, seven of clubs or seven, six of clubs. I think jamming, jamming with that could probably be fine. Especially if you think you can get your opponents to fold out hands like ace, king, because then you're just printing a lot of fold equity, right? If you think you're going to get called every time, though, like let's say for some reason, splashy guy is like fist pumping, trying to get his money in, obviously, if you have seven, six of clubs here, well, you definitely don't want to jam because you're going to get called and you're going to be behind. Not necessarily against King Jack, but against King Queen and sets and whatnot. So you want to be jamming your draws when you think you have fold equity. And I think we probably do have a little bit here, but it's definitely close. So if I'm jamming my draws, I also want to jam with some nut hands, which is going to be King Queen and pocket sevens. And well, here it is. So I do jam, and now Splashy Guy has an easy fold. Easy fold. But he called. I don't know why he called. I think it's a horrible call. Just like I thought preflop, he should have raised or folded initially. Then 
Facing the 2600 raise, he should have folded. On the flop, he should not have bet or bet tiny. And then once I jam on him, he has a very, very easy fold, especially with the jack of clubs in his hand. Some people think, oh, I have the jack of clubs. That gives me some backdoor equity. I mean, yeah, it does a little bit, but at the same time, it means that I'm going to be way more tilted towards value hands. So if I have a value hand, how does king jack fare against a value hand? Well, it loses to them, right? It loses to literally every value hand. So atrociously played hand by my opponent. Please do not do that. If you do this, you're not going to win money from poker. And if you're here studying poker with me, I want you to win from poker. I'm trying to teach you to get better because I know you want to improve your life. So don't do what this guy did. <laughs> That's going to be it for this hand for pokernews.com. If you enjoy this, let them know. And be sure to check back next week for another fun hand. Good luck in your games.